And we move to questions to the Minister for Ag Infrastructure, and I call John Blue. On, Mr. Speaker. Um, thank the member for the question. Uh, the planning application for the High Town Incinerator is for the construction of a residual waste treatment facility at the former High Town Quarry in Mollusk. The facility is designed to deal with the residual waste from the six councils within the ARC 21 Waste Management Group. Uh, and as my officials will be making a recommendation to me on the planning application, it is important that I consider carefully and take into account all views in reaching any decision that needs to be taken. In the interim, as I hope the member appreciates, it would not be appropriate for me to comment on the individual planning merits or otherwise of this application. John Blair for supplementary. Deputy Speaker, thank you, and can I thank the Minister for that question, uh, appreciating, of course, the, the reasons he stated uh, for the lack of more detail or prediction around the answer. But can I ask, in relation to these matters and on current such applications and future applications around risk management, if the Minister can commit to working with uh, the DERA Minister, local councils, environmental groups and others to ensure that such applications around waste management are dealt with in the interest of the environment. Call Jerry Kelly. <laughs> Excuse me, Minister. Excuse me. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, uh, um, in taking up my post, you know, one of my priorities, and I've made it clear, is around tackling the climate emergency. I very much see uh, that we should be doing more to promote recycling, and I've already committed to working with the DERA Minister as together we try to advance that climate action agenda. I call Jerry Kelly. Uh, thank you, Minister, for answering that instead of me. Um, I, I, I noticed when she was answering the last question that uh, I, I, mean, I appreciate she has to take all the evidence in that there, but um, would I point out to her or ask her when, first of all, that decision would be forthcoming, if she has uh, some notion of when that would be. This is a, an ongoing and very controversial issue um, over a serious number of months, indeed years now. And will she take into consideration the um, reports that have been made uh, beforehand, that it was in front of uh, previous ministers, and therefore there is a volume of information, and not just what might look like as new information. Some of the older information is very, very important. I thank the member for his question, and yes, I am aware uh, of the nature of the application. I am aware of the considerable interest in it. I am aware of the length of time uh, that has been involved, uh, and do assure the member that um, I will be taking all of the evidence that is presented before me, following all due process. Um, I am not in a position to say when a decision will be reached. I haven't received any information or submissions yet from officials, but to assure him uh, and to assure all those who are following this application with interest that I will be fair, robust uh, and impartial and examining all of the evidence and coming to the best possible decision. Okay, call Pam Cameron. Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answers so far. Would the Minister agree with me that not only can much more be done in terms of recycling, uh, but also uh, in terms of actually not creating waste that then needs to be dealt with, and also if, if and when uh, somebody ever makes a decision that actually incineration is the only way forward. Actually, there are other options in terms of incineration other than building a new uh, white elephant, which isn't required and, in fact, would need to be fed. I'm conscious that I don't want to step into the portfolio or brief of my colleague, Minister Edwin Poots, uh, but I am very clear that we should be doing more as a society to promote a circular economy. We should be reducing the packaging uh, that we are seeing in our shops and our supply chain. Uh, and as individuals uh, and consumers, we should be making better choices when it comes to purchasing products with less package, but also doing all that we can to recycle. I think that we face a very real uh, and global challenge in terms of the climate emergency, and that all of us across all government departments uh, across society, and very much even in our own homes, should be doing much more on this front. Call Paula Bradley. Deputy Speaker, question two. I thank the member for her question. Uh, the aim of park and ride at rail stations is to support modal shift to public transport. It does this by enabling those starting their journey by car from rural areas and smaller towns to access rail for the larger part of their journey. 
It is for this reason, particularly given the budgetary constraints, that park and ride sites are located on the strategic rail network and less prevalent at more central stations in close proximity to the city centre. In line with this, 113 spaces are provided at White Abbey Station. While there is growing demand, it is not possible to extend this facility. This is due to the park and ride being landlocked. However, plans are being advanced, subject to funding, to add up to 500 spaces at Mosley West and Troopers Lane. I am supportive of expanding our park and ride schemes. To complete all of the park and ride schemes planned, though, would cost £39 million. This year's budget was £2 million, severely, severely curtailing my department's ability to make as much progress as we would like, given the multiple benefits derived from park and ride schemes. As the member will be aware, infrastructure is key to connecting our communities, and it is the bedrock on which we should build our ambitions for delivery of radical change to improve lives. I can assure the member of my commitment to improving lives, connecting communities and challenging the climate emergency in the time ahead. Paula Bradley for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for her answer? And I fully understand about, um, certainly about White Abbey train station and the, the fact that it's landlocked. But there are se severe problems down there from Station Road along Apris into Ferna into Kings Park, where we have a busy bus service that can quite often knock it along the road, which is there to help the most vulnerable in our community. And something has to be done, whether that's getting our, our traffic attendants out, ticketing people, doing something, because they're the very people. And that, when I mean, you talk about key to connecting communities. Because of the situation down there, we're not connecting communities. We're allowing people to park across driveways, to park across roads and block roads on occasions. As the member will know, the car parking provision at White Abbey Station is a TransLink facility and therefore it's not enforced uh, by my department's enforcement service providers traffic attendants. So there is no legislation in place that would permit that type of enforcement. I am aware of undisciplined parking on Old Station Road in the vicinity of White Abbey Park and Ride, and my department is currently progressing, no waiting at any time legislation. This will allow two-way traffic to run at all times. The legislation has been advertised, and I hope that it will be implemented within the next few months. Here, I'm Sir Cahillboy, and for your cash, they called Cahillboy. Uh, last thing, Corns, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I'm going to thank our minister for her answers, but the minister knows the value of parking rides in terms of addressing congestion and also the air pollution of many of the towns. But could the Minister give a, uh, or would she prioritise rather uh, park and ride schemes right throughout the north? But she knows the benefits of them and bear in mind what she said about the budgets. But I think, Minister, um, to tackle the climate threat, if we're serious about it, I think um, there's an opportunity now to, or would you explain what's your long term plans for park and rides right across the north? I thank the member uh, for his question and I can assure him that I can see the multiple benefits that can be derived from our park and ride schemes. Uh, I do have an ambitious programme. The department uh, has a number of park and ride schemes, extensions and new schemes that we would like to see delivered. Um, but that would cost, to programme current uh, programmes, that would cost £39 million. Uh, the budget that I had, my department had this year for park and ride was £2 million. That has severely curtailed the department's ambition. I have had negotiations and discussions with the finance minister and other colleagues because if I am able to secure more money, given pressures that are new and emerging, I would absolutely do more and will do more when it comes to delivering on park and ride. But as with all of these things, we have to at times cut our cloth. Here, sir, Matthew Toole for your cash. I call Matthew Toole for a question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thanks to the minister for her answer so far. Um, uh, accepting that for the next few weeks at least we may see fewer people on all our public transport infrastructure. Has she given any thought to um, whether the phase two of the glider programme might want to meet up with um, the park and ride system at Carnes Hill in South Belfast and even whether it, perhaps it could go a little further out to Cardiff and encourage people from driving in from the south to, to use that service? 
Uh, the glider project has been hugely successful. We look at passenger numbers, when we look at uh, the usage, particularly for older uh, citizens and those with disabilities. As a member will be aware, there are proposals for the Phase 2 uh, glider, which would extend from the south of the city across to North Belfast. Um, the outline business case and interim business case is being prepared for consideration. I would hope to be in a position where later this year we would see us moving to public consultation on the proposed routes. I call Paula Bradshaw for a quick. Um, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, Minister, can you outline the plans that are to be implemented by TransLink to deal with COVID-19 to protect the health and safety of the public and workers and to ensure that services continue to operate? Thank you. I thank the member for that very important question. I am acutely aware of the concerns many communities and people have regarding the COVID-19 virus and how best to tackle the outbreak. My department is working with all government departments, agencies, operators and the public health agency to respond to and plan for this evolving situation. No effort will be spared in our work to tackle this outbreak. My department has received advice from the Chief Medical Officer in relation to the coronavirus epidemic, which has been shared with TransLink, and the organisation has implemented a range of measures in light of this advice. This includes enhanced weekly cleaning of buses and enhanced twice-weekly cleaning of trains. This is in addition to regular daily cleaning that is undertaken for our public transport fleet. In addition, stations are being cleaned more frequently and when cleaners are in sight, an enhanced cleaning of stations will take place. Throughout all of this, we should underline the Public Health Agency's advice, which states that personal hygiene is the appropriate method for protecting all of us. As part of this, TransLink will be providing guidance on COVID-19 on its website to keep customers updated on the latest guidance and developments. I can assure you that TransLink continues to review its guidance in light of advice from the Public Health Agency and that the safety of the public and its staff will remain TransLink's main priority. Call Roy Biggs for a question. <clears throat> Back to the original question, I'm aware of the need to improve uh, parking ride facilities at White Abbey Station, but in terms of uh, improving parking and ride at more city centre sites, would the Minister agree with me that there would be much better, much more advantage to the environment and to the community if park and ride facilities further down the railway line were developed, such as ad addressing the uh, full car parks in Carnick Fergus uh, and at Whitehead, and to look at redeveloping uh, further park and ride facilities on the Larne Line, or for that matter, uh, the fully subscribed park and ride facilities for uh, Ulster Bus at Millbrook. Member for his question. I think the fact that we have seen uh, maximum capacity at a number of our park and ride schemes is testimony to the success of the scheme. All of this, I think, has to be underpinned by our efforts to see a modal shift in the way that people um, get about their daily lives. We should be encouraging more people to walk and to cycle, and I think we should be factoring that into our decision making in terms of the location of our park and ride schemes. I want to assure the member that I do want to do what I can, but again, it is budget dependent, and when I have the money, I will try to do as much as I possibly can, but I have to be honest and realistic that there are severe constraints within which I must operate. I now call Kelly Armstrong. Question number three. I am aware of the increasing issues at wastewater treatment works and in the sewage system. I am concerned that this is having an impact on the environment and on planning decisions in respect of housing and business development seeking connection to the sewage network across the north. I have outlined to executive colleagues the pressures facing my department, including those of water and wastewater. I have also made representations directly to the Finance Minister, impressing the need for investment in order to ensure that we can provide the critical infrastructure needed to ensure we can build the many more homes that we need and to drive economic growth so that we can improve the lives of citizens right across Northern Ireland. In the Strangford constituency, the following capital investment schemes are scheduled by Northern Ireland Water to start in its current price control period. New wastewater treatment works in Ballygowan, an investment of approximately £6 million, and new wastewater treatment works at Ards North, 
at a value of £18 million, which will serve Ballywalter, Ballyhaskin and Caradore. These works are scheduled to achieve their beneficial use early in the next price control period, known as PC21, which starts uh, in 2021. In PC21, an investment of around £143 million has been identified to address wastewater system capacity issues affecting development in the Strangford constituency. However, all PC21 projects are subject to prioritisation and the availability of adequate funding. I therefore welcome the commitments made in the New Decade New Approach Agreement to address years of underfunding in wastewater, and I am working with the Finance Minister and my executive colleagues to secure the level of finance required. Kelly Armstrong for a supplement. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank you to the Minister. And I can actually say to the Minister, she is my 100% um, backup in getting that additional money because we all know the impact that the, um, the water system is having on planning. But could I ask the Minister just to confirm um, what negotiations there will be with builders, developers, um, to ensure that if they are putting in pumping stations, that they're going to comply and be able to attach onto our wastewater treatment work so it's not a waste of time? And will there be bonds put in place to ensure that those that are putting their own um, pumping stations in will be held to account to ensure they connect appropriately. Thank the member uh, for her question. Um, and this is an area that I have begun to look at. Uh, I've been engaging and beginning to engage with a range of stakeholders uh, because the facts are that no drains, no cranes. And so it's how we can work collaboratively uh, and in partnership um, to address that issue. Um, I am at some point in the not too distant future hoping to write to executive colleagues to see if there are other things that we be, could be doing around developers contributions but I'm certainly uh, of the case that we do have a huge issue when it comes to matching the need for investment in our wastewater infrastructure. I think there is a lot that my department could do uh, with developers in terms of sustainable drainage systems and with housing associations in terms of sustainable drainage systems uh, so it's very much an area that I'm intending to focus on going forward. Um, Minister, last week our committee was at NI Water and they had outlined the priorities in the PC21 and I was shocked to discover that Derry, Stuban and Oma uh, were not included given the level of uh, inequalities in the North West. So I want to ask you in relation to the Shandones development scheme in Craigan because I know there's a massive hole in the budget. Uh, caused by British austerity cuts, but given that that's for almost 100 houses, we need a sewage and wastewater treatment plant built there, and therefore the developers are saying that they are willing to assist, but they also have NI Water has to adopt that, uh, if that is the case. Is so the just, at? Advise, just advise the Minister that um, it's up to her discretion why she answered or not. It has to be related to the original question, but I'll leave it at the Minister's discretion. Speaker, it is a very important uh, issue and we have 116 areas now in Northern Ireland where we are constrained in terms of planning applications and being able to build homes and being able to grow our economy. It's not just an issue for the Department for Infrastructure, it's an issue for all of us and I do recognise that there are particular pinch points. Uh, so I want to work with all members, I want to work with all ministers uh, so that we can actually deliver homes, for me that's very important, homes but also create the opportunities to grow our economy in places like Derry, Strabane uh, and right across Northern Ireland. Before I move to the next question, would I advise members seated please not to interrupt while other members have the floor? That's my job. Okay, thank you. Uh, I now call William Humphrey for a question. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. In relation to the strains on the water waste system, can I ask the Minister, she'll be aware of the pressures that there are at Duncrew Street, can I ask the Minister, in her conversations with the Finance Minister and other Ministers, is she closer to be giving any information to this House? on the uh, upgrade of that particular centre? Um, I can assure the member that discussions have taken place, that they are taking place. Um, 
as you will know, there has been no allocation uh, of the budget, so I can't give a definitive response uh, to him uh, in respect of his particular question. But what I can do is to reassure him that, for me, investment in our wastewater infrastructure is critical. It's actually essential if we are serious about delivering um, on the outcomes in our programme for government. Um, so I will not be found wanting in terms of continuing to make representations, and I will not be found wanting in working with all executive colleagues uh, to see that that ambition is realised. Call Rosemary Barton. Thank you. Minister, um, you, will, you, will you will accept that it is your responsibility and do you accept that it's also the responsibility of the Northern Ireland Executive to ensure that there's sufficient capital investment in to enable Northern Ireland water to treat wastewater and protect the environment? And it's not enough for some ministers to say what they would not do without solving the problem. I agree very much with the member that ensuring that our citizens have access to clean, safe drinking water, ensuring that our citizens have access to safe water treatment uh, works is essential. Um, it is also essential if we are serious about growing our economy, if we are serious about tackling regional imbalance, if we are serious about tackling the climate emergency and we are serious about improving people's lives. I welcome the approach being taken in the programme for government because I think this particular issue demonstrates that it does not reside solely in one government department. We all have a responsibility uh, to play. I have made the case on this particular issue uh, to executive colleagues. Um, they have been very responsive back. And so I hope that when we see budget allocations, mindful that we are in a very difficult period right now, which will bring with it its own uh, financial difficulties, that we will work together to begin to address this because there has been years upon years of underinvestment in our wastewater infrastructure and we are now coming to a very critical point. Iram Sir Justin McNulty for your cash. I call Justin McNulty for a question. Firstly, can I thank the Minister for the swift measures she has already implemented to help tackle the unprecedented challenge we all now face, that is coronavirus, COVID-19. Can I ask the Minister what impact has this place been closed for three years had on the ability of DFA to provide sufficient capacity with the, uh, within the wastewater infrastructure to enable building new homes? and businesses? I think that uh, in my department, in terms of its responsibilities, um, it has been severely impacted. I think all government departments uh, have been severely impacted because for three years we had no one in charge, we had no one in position to take decisions so that we could do things in an improved way or we could begin to do things uh, in a new way. Uh, people will be frustrated about what has happened in, in the past three years. I think the issue for us now is how ambitious are we for this place of ours? How committed are we to working together to ensure that we improve the lives of everybody that lives here, and particularly the most vulnerable? We can look back and we can be angry and we can be frustrated. But I choose to look forward. I'm choosing to work with executive colleagues in good faith because people of Northern Ireland have been let down for three years. We now need to lift them up and be delivering so much more for them. As question number four has been withdrawn, I now call Jonathan Buckley. Following the flooding that occurred as a result of the heavy rainfall over a number of months during the 2015-16 winter period, an independent review carried out by Professor Alan Strong was published in December 2016. The report made 10 headline recommendations which covered a number of areas that would help to further improve government and society's ability to manage and respond to flooding. Recommendations included a review of the management of water levels in Loch Ney, which concluded that any alternative operation of floodgates, other than the existing procedure carried out by my department, would not have significantly reduced water levels on Loch Ney. Other learning included the need for a coordinator to lead local government emergency preparedness work, support for the community resilience approaches that have been developed by my department with multi-agency partners, the benefits of natural flood risk management techniques, improvements to flood risk communications, and research into crops in flood prone areas. I can advise the member that all recommendations have now been addressed and many positive benefits have been already realised as a result in the management of flood risk here.
Call Jonathan Buckley for a supplement. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her response. A week and a half ago, the Agriculture Minister met alongside myself with local farmers who again had concerns with rising lock levels uh, and rising tides that potentially their businesses and also their land could be impacted in the same dramatic way. They fear that the lessons haven't been learnt uh, when they respond and look at areas such as dredging of the River Ban and indeed lock levels, with some stating the potential for lock gates that have been broken. Uh, for a considerable period of time. Would the Minister commit uh, to meeting alongside myself uh, and the Minister of Agriculture and also uh, the member, Mrs Dolores Kelly, uh, to see if we can address these, um, these particular concerns before uh, we get to a situation where we are facing the same situation again? I thank the member for his question. and um, I was aware of the particularly heavy uh, spell of rain of businesses' concerns. Um, I know Dolores Kelly had raised it, uh, and I know that you have been raising it as well. So I am happy to meet with uh, business people, with farmers in the area, to set out what the department has achieved in terms of recommendations to address any concerns or issues that people might have about the operation of gates uh, and what the department is doing in terms of managing the water levels in Loch Ness. Uh, happy to have that meeting and to provide that reassurance to people. I'm sorry, Dolores Kelly for when you cashed called Dolores Kelly for <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Speaker. And I very much welcome uh, that uh, joint cooperation across the divide. And, uh, but there's also fishermen that are very uh, concerned about um, the water level. So I wonder, um, Minister, would you agree that <coughs> to also meet with the Fishermen's Cooperative at Toom? In, in relation to uh, water levels, but also want to place on record my thanks to your officials for dealing swiftly with the business that were under threat from recent flooding around the shores of Loch Ness, particularly at Kinnigo. I thank the member for her kind words, and I also wish to put on record my thanks to those in my department who work to protect those impacted by the flooding at Loch Ness. Um, I'm happy to meet with the Fishermen's Cooperative um, when I'm there, and perhaps we could do uh, a morning or an afternoon where we could meet all of the organisations and businesses yeah. in the area. I'm sorry, Declan McAleer for when you cash. I call Declan McAleer. On the topic of flooding, the member will be aware that in St Mills last year there was 30 homes flooded, and I think it was August time, and uh, I'm aware that her department is considering improvement to the drainage network in that area to prevent it happening again. Um, is there any update on that particular piece of work? I am aware uh, of the flooding incident there, and it is an issue and an area that my department is looking at. I don't have in front of me details, but what I am happy to do is to write to the member to provide a full update. I'm Sir Orlihi Flynn for New Cash. I call Orlihi Flynn for New Cash. Gor Miag at last can call you. Cash to Verishay. Question number six. Let us I want to um, thank the member for asking this question um, on an issue that we are both very passionate about. Um, mental health and well-being are extremely important to me, both personally and as a minister. And it is also an important issue within my department. Individually and collectively, particularly through the Executive Working Group on Mental Wellbeing, Resilience and Suicide Prevention, we all have a responsibility to act to address this issue, which is devastating families uh, across Northern Ireland. I recognise that our infrastructure has an important role to play, both in terms of improving mental health and preventing suicides, and I am committed to ensuring that my department contributes fully to this agenda. I fully appreciate that engineering solutions may provide part of the answer, and I will be led by the expert advice. My department is currently working in partnership with stakeholders to consider positive actions that can be taken along a number of locations, including the M2 and the Westlink corridor. However, we must also all work together to address the underlying problems and the contributory factors to poor mental health right across our society. I believe an innovative and collaborative approach is required, and I look forward to working closely with executive colleagues through the executive working group, uh, but also working with local communities, experts, stakeholders and staff to promote positive mental health and resilience. Just time for a very brief supplementary, please, Orly. Supplementary has been covered already in relation to the bridges, so thanks very much to the Minister. 
You can take very quick supplementary by William Humphrey then, very quick. Very kind. Um, Minister, I, I welcome the answer so far. You will be aware of the tragic scale of, of suicides that there are in our constituency in North Belfast. Can you assure the House, in terms of the executive working group, that there is work going across the, the executive t uh, table to ensure that the, 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 the pandemic of, of suicides that affect Northern Ireland in general and North Belfast in particular are being addressed? I am very aware of the, the devastation being caused by poor mental health and suicide, particularly in our constituency in North Belfast, and we've had some very, very difficult times uh, of late. This is an issue that I believe transcends party politics. Uh, I sit with executive ministers uh, on a range of issues, and I have to say that the discussion that took place at the last meeting of the executive subgroup was sincere. It was genuine, and ministers from all departments were committed to doing uh, what they can because they have been impacted on this, if not from within their own families, then with their friends and within their own community. Uh, so I do believe that we will have sincere, genuine, collaborative working on this. That ends listed questions. I now move to topical questions. We have 15 minutes, and I call Ms. Claire Bailey. Ms. Bailey. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, and I note that there, the transport unions um, in the south in Dublin today were meeting with state-owned transport companies to discuss whether they can, can continue to operate services in the ongoing serious measures being implemented and whether cash handling in particular on public transport um, needs to stop. I'm wondering if the minister can let us know whether any such discussions have happened here between herself and TransLink. Uh, I can assure the member that um, uh, my department and my officials are in daily contact with senior officials in TransLink. Um, there has been a number of measures put in in terms of, of cleaning and upscaling the cleaning that is required in terms of the advice um, uh, that is being given to staff. In relation to contact with customers, TransLink is amending its procedures for staff to ensure the safety of everyone involved. This has included the position whereby no contact between staff and the public will take place for ticket checks. In addition, TransLink has issued staff with personal hygiene products in the form of hand sanitizers and wipes, whilst all hand washing facilities are continually replenished. I can also confirm that glider ticket vending machines are cleaned weekly, and I have asked TransLink to continue to review this in line with PHA guidance. However, we all must be mindful of advice from the Public Health Agency, whereby personal hygiene is one of the most important at the moment. And I would therefore again reiterate the appeal to people to follow the medical advice to slow down the spread of the coronavirus um, by making sure that they very frequently wash their hands. Claire Bailey for a supplementary. Thank you again, I thank the Minister for her answer. Has the Minister any concerns that um, our transport systems and our cross-border transport systems in particular um, are acting in line with each other or are there any ongoing difficulties there? I can assure uh, the member that um, we are in close uh, communication. Uh, the situation facing us is unprecedented. Uh, we need to work together uh, right across uh, this House, uh, across all government departments and across these islands, north and south. I am committed to doing that uh, as a Minister for Infrastructure, uh, and I am committed to working with TransLink, with our community transport operators, um, with the Public Health Agency, and with those uh, responsible for transport in the South as well. Thank you. And if I uh, may take the Minister back to the glider issue, as raised by Matthew O'Toole earlier. Can, can I ask the Minister of Current Consideration regarding the north of Belfast to south of Belfast glider link will take into consideration that the population around Molusk and Glengormley has increased massively over the years, uh, indeed in recent years, and also that a great number of people have that area as their place of work? I thank the member for his question. Um, the Belfast Rapid Transit Phase 2 proposes to extend the existing network to serve, as I have said, North Belfast, South Belfast, Queen's University and the City Hospital, and was submitted by my department for inclusion in the Belfast Region City Deal. 
My officials are working closely with the councils and other partners to take forward a feasibility and options appraisal which will help in identifying route options. We are aiming to have this work completed by the end of this calendar year and it is my intention that a public consultation exercise will follow to allow the public and members to comment on route options. I accept the point that he's making in terms of Molusk. There has been significant population uh, growth in the area, and I would encourage the member, when that consultation uh, goes out, to be feeding his views in, as I'm sure he will continue to do uh, at every opportunity possible. John Blair, for a supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. The Minister will be surprised and going to have a, take an opportunity now to do the same thing and ask that um, will full consideration also be given to the fact that um, an alternative cor corridor to the one I mentioned, which would be, of course, the Antrim Road corridor, um, <coughs> has, has to be accepted as already uh, served by a railway line, which the Antrim Road corridor isn't, and I, I would be hopeful that that issue as well would be taken into consideration. I wouldn't want to preempt the outcome of any public consultation, but no doubt there will be consideration given to issues like the level of demand, the level of public transport service provision already in place along those routes. Uh, all of those things will be will be an analysed in the round. And of course, I would ask him, as with others, to encourage as many people as possible to respond to the consultation so that we can get to the right option. Call Roy Beggs for a question. Earlier, the Minister highlighted um, procedures that TransLink were putting in place to minimise the risk of transmission of the coronavirus uh, in public transport. Uh, but given her role uh, also for, for taxi operations in Northern Ireland, uh, has the Minister or will the Minister uh, issue such practical guidance to taxi operators to minimise the risk of spread uh, for those who use taxis? Uh, I the advice to everyone um, is to follow the public health agency uh, in terms of the advice that it's giving out and I would encourage everyone to do that. Uh, I have been gone a round of engagement with the taxi industry actually about taxi related matters and concerns but I will be using that opportunity to also make sure that they are as updated as possible uh, on advice coming forward from the public health agency. Uh, I'm also happy to engage in that proactively uh, in terms of contacting the industry and its representatives to ensure that the latest advice is being followed for the safety, obviously, of our taxi drivers and also for their customers. Roy Beggs for a supplementary. <clears throat> Does the Minister recognise that our public sector workers who provide public transport and indeed our taxi uh, operators provide an essential service and without them, many of our health service staff will not be able to get to work and to treat patients? I very much recognise that. Um, they are the backbone uh, of our economy and our society in terms of connecting people and ensuring that they're able to access work uh, and to access services. So I don't disagree with the member at all in anything that he has just said. Here, Sir Deglan McAleer, for when you cast, I call Declan McAleer for a question. The Minister will be very aware of just how crucial the A5 geocarriageway is in terms of east-west regional balance here in the North End for connecting the, the, the north-west of the island uh, the, across the whole of the island. So the Minister, Minister will be aware that the public inquiry has concluded last week. Could she give any assessment as to a timeline for her department scrutinising the responses and moving us on to the next stage? Gormaga. The member will be aware that uh, in outlining my priorities from taking up post, I've said that I am serious about doing what I can to tackle regional imbalance. Uh, the A5 uh, is a project that is referenced specifically in the New Decade New Approach Agreement. As he has outlined, it has been subject to a public inquiry. Um, when the findings of the public inquiry um, are completed, there will be a submission made to me, and I'm mindful that following due process and ensuring that all of the statutory processes are complete. I need to do so in a robust manner, but also to expedite things. People have waited very long, uh, for a very, very long time on this project. Um, but to assure the member that as soon as I am in a position to be able to make a decision on it, I can assure him that I will be. Keish Dorlinta, Declan McAleer. Call Declan McAleer for a supplementary question. 
Colonel, I'm going to thank the Minister for uh, her response and her assurance that this remains a, a top priority for her department. Will the Minister also give an assurance that she will continue to liaise with her counterparts in, in the South and re as regards the future funding for the road? Because at the outset, when the road was envisaged, there was um, I think it was planned that, the, that more than one of the phases, or indeed all of the phases, would move ahead simultaneously. Will she give an assurance she will continue to liaise with her counterpart in Dublin and potentially look at the scheme moving forward should we, once we get past all of the, the outstanding hurdles to get moving on ahead? Colonel Algood? Uh, as the member points out, you know, as part of the new decade, new approach, the Irish Government did reaffirm a £75 million commitment um, in the Fresh Start Agreement to the A5 project to complete Phase 1A from new buildings to Straban North. Uh, I can assure the member that as soon uh, as possible, uh, I will be engaging with my counterpart in the South because it is important that that commitment is realised. I believe that there is full intention to see that commitment realised by the Irish Government, uh, and I will be continuing to work with my counterpart to ensure that we get this project delivered. Iram Sir Colin McGrath, when you cashed, I call Colin McGrath for a question. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answers so far. Um, given the current outbreak of coronavirus, um, the smooth operation of the infrastructure department is going to be critical. We've heard some reference to Translic, we've heard some reference to taxis, but could the Minister give us a breakdown of the whole department uh, contingency planning that has been undertaken? As I've said, um, I am aware of the wide concerns uh, many communities and people have regarding the um, coronavirus and how best to tackle the outbreak. I can assure the member that the department is working with all government departments, agencies, operators and the public health agency to respond to and plan for this evolving situation. I am clear that no effort will be spared and I am committed to working with my arm length bodies and my executive colleagues to ensure public safety. The most effective means of protecting the public against the spread of the coronavirus is for all of us to follow the medical advice and frequently wash hands with soap and water or clean them with alcohol based hand rub. However, in line with PHA advice, the Department and its bodies have introduced a range of contingency measures, both to protect the public against the spread of COVID-19 and ensure that as the situation evolves, essential services and connections are maintained. For example, TransLink has implemented a range of measures which are continually reviewed in light of the latest advice and developments. This includes enhanced weekly cleaning of buses and enhanced twice weekly cleaning of trains, which is in addition to the regular daily cleaning that is undertaken for our public transport fleet. Enhanced cleaning regimes have also been introduced to bus and rail stations. My officials are also working closely with NI Water, its regulators and with DEFRA and the wider industry in the UK on a coordinated response to managing issues arising as a result of COVID-19. Northern Ireland Water has assured me that it is confident it is taking all the necessary steps to maintain services during the current outbreak. The company's priority is to ensure the continued provision of water and wastewater services to customers while maintaining the safety and well-being of all staff. I am also urgently exploring options to maximise flexibility around drivers' hours rules without compromising on road safety. There are a range of other measures, and I will continue to keep the public and members fully updated. Colin McGrath, supplementary for Colin McGrath. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, as one of the minister could give us more uh, information about the discussions that she's having with operators to ensure that there is provision during this very worrying time. Uh, on Saturday, uh, I issued a letter to all councils in Northern Ireland on the urgent matter of enabling retailers of food, sanitary and other essential items to increase the frequency of deliveries to their stores to support the response to COVID-19. The letter, which comes into effect immediately, was issued because of the exceptional challenges we are facing at this time. I have also asked officials to meet urgently this week with Freight NI to discuss a number of concerns that they have uh, as an industry and importantly so that we can work with them to put solutions in place. I know that this is a frightening time for people 
and I want to assure them that my officials are working round the clock across my department and with other government departments to respond and put plans in place to deal with this constantly changing situation. And as I said, Mr Deputy Speaker, I will keep members and the public fully updated. Time for a brief question from Rachel Wood. Thank you. Um, can I ask the Minister, in light of the ruling by the Court of Appeal on 27 February 2020 regarding Heathrow Airport expansion, for assessment of any regionally significant developments that are not consistent with our obligations underneath the Paris Agreement? I am very much aware of the, the Heathrow ruling, and my officials are currently working through it to identify all implications and how that relates to my department. That ends the period for listed questions. And we now move to an urgent oral question. Mr. Chris Little has given notice of an urgent.